if we choose, if we choose to get through every door around the world with the gospel, then I have to tell you, and I want you to get this today, then one of the things that God began to speak to my heart is, and we're gonna share this, that snakes come out after the storm. Snakes come out after the storm. After 18 months of getting through what many thought to be the hardest battle that the church around the country and around the world has faced in this 21st century, I want you to listen very carefully. Our job is not done since we opened up the front doors of the church. Our job is not done. Now we are preparing, I believe, and I'll explain what I mean, for snake strikes as we seek to see every door around the world open up. The enemy will not allow this to go unchallenged. Can I, can I give you something to rejoice about since last week? Can I tell you? people that are joining us right now, not just watching a service, but connect groups around the world are now in Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Dominican, Finland, France, Ghana, Great, Greece, Haiti, Honduras, Hong Kong, Israel, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Panama, Philippines, Spain, Sweden, Russia, and the Ukraine. Hallelujah. So let me tell you this time, Square Church, before we pray. Here is something I saw in a church in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and it says this, God always promises a safe landing, but he never promised a smooth flight. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Buckle up, turbulence is ahead, and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. I believe that you are going to challenge us. I believe that you're going to encourage us today. I believe that God, those that are listening here in this building, around the country and around the world, oh God, are gonna understand that, that, that greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. And we believe that today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, hallelujah. I wanna share with you today, it was on July 20th, 1985, that one of the most amazing discoveries were made just off the Florida Keys. It was the Spanish gold ship was discovered, the Atoka, right off Florida. The cargo that they saw some decades ago was estimated to be over $400 million. In fact, they said that the treasure had 24 tons of silver, coins and bullion, 125 gold bars, 1,200 pounds of silverware. But the thing that interested me, as we're going to begin to dive into today, was another treasure that they found on this boat, the Atoka. You ready for this? They found 400-year-old seeds, like plant seeds, in the airtight container. Seeds that been, has been sitting on the bottom of the ocean for 400 years. Think of it, seeds in a container on a ship in the ocean, ocean floor, no oxygen, and four centuries. And some scientists asked in 1985 this question, can these seeds grow? After 400 years in a container, in the ocean, on a ship, at the bottom of the ocean. And folks, they took those seeds after everything was against it, and over in the UK, they planted 400-year-old seeds. And you know what they found? There was still life in those seeds. And they began to grow. That regardless of the conditions they were put in, the power of life in 400-year-old seeds began to grow. A storm couldn't stop them. The ocean couldn't stop it. A shipwreck couldn't stop it. 400 years couldn't stop it. And can I just remind you today, Matthew 13 says, God's word is called a seed. 
And I want you to understand this. God's word has staying power. It keeps growing regardless of the adverse conditions it is put in. Let me just remind you, you can try to shut it down. You can try to vote it out. You can try to remove it, but you're dealing with the word of God. It will grow. It will get large. It will spread. You can't stop the word of God. Today, I want to take you to another ship, though. This one is not off the Florida Keys. This one is in the Mediterranean. And this one is not found in 1985, but it's found around, around 30 or 40 AD, and it's found in the Mediterranean Ocean, and it's Acts chapter 27. And God spoke his word, his seed, in adverse conditions, and it didn't stop what God had to speak. See, in Acts 27, there was a prison transport that with 200, the Bible says, and 76 prisoners on board, but there was one very famous prisoner that was on that board and amongst them. That man was the Apostle Paul. He was part of those 276 prisoners. The boat was going to Rome, but it also was getting ready to go into a storm. And eventually, not just a storm, but it was getting ready to go into a shipwreck. And in fact, it would be so bad of a shipwreck that they were going to have to float on the pieces of wood to even survive. And they did. They floated, all 276 of them, to shore on pieces of wood. And before they can catch their breath, the cold weather, cold conditions came. They started to build a fire. And a snake comes out and bites. You ready for this? Only one of them. Only one of the 276 convicts was bitten by a snake. Guess who it was? The Apostle Paul. (laughs) Of all 276, I have a strange feeling that that was orchestrated by the enemy himself. But he is not, the Apostle Paul is not supposed to die in a shipwreck. He wasn't gonna die from the cold or from the venom of a poisonous snake because there was a seed that God put inside of him. He was supposed to go to Rome and there was a seed, that word, that was gonna come out of him that was gonna begin to spread around the world and we're gonna get to what that seed was in a second. But that word was gonna survive a shipwreck, it was gonna survive frigid temperatures and it was gonna survive venomous snakes. Because God's word, I'm just gonna tell you, let's just update it for a second. God's word can make it through shutdowns, pandemics and whatever comes our way, God's word can make it through. Here's the point I want you to understand. If the devil can't stop the word with a storm, then he's going to attack it with a snake. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul, that on the other side of a storm was a viper, but it didn't stop the word of God. Let me give you, here's, here were Paul's words and the conditions that they came in. I want to show you. This is Paul's words, like the seeds in the Atoka, the Acts 27 ship was going down but the ship, the, but the word of God was going to begin to grow. A ship was going down, but that seed was about to go. See, in Acts 27, it was, the Bible says that that ship was at the mercy of the high winds. Listen to the adversity it was going to be up against. There was no ability, it says, that there was to have steer the ship. Violently being storm-tossed, they threw everything overboard. It said it was so bad they couldn't even see the sky. And verse 21 says, all hope was abandoned of even survival. And a word in those conditions, adverse conditions, comes to the Apostle Paul. I wanna read to you what the Apostle Paul said. Here's where the word comes. The seed that was gonna be, the container was Paul, the seed was the word of God, and here's what Paul said. He said, for this very night, what night? The night we couldn't see the sky, the night we couldn't control the ship, the night that we threw everything overboard, the night that high winds went contrary to us, and the night that the ship started breaking apart. He said, on that very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me. Here comes the word of God saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You will stand before Caesar, right in the midst of the cracking of the wood, hearing the rain begin to come upon that boat. He says, don't be afraid. You're going to stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you 
all those who are sailing with you, he says, those are the ones that are going to be able to say that we survive. They, Paul says, because I survive, everyone here is going to survive. And I want to read to you the end of the story. Acts 28, 14, right in between snake bites and shipwrecks, the Bible says in Acts 28, 14, we came to Rome. He said nothing could stop us. If the word was there, there wasn't frigid cold, there wasn't a shipwreck, there wasn't floating on an ocean or a snake bite that can stop the word of God. If God said you're gonna stand before Caesar and you're gonna go to Rome, then you're gonna do that because God's word cannot be stopped. I love what the, the 18th century, 18th century uh, American and English evangelist George Whitfield said. Listen to these words, he said this, I am immortal until God calls me home. Let me say that again. I am immortal until God calls me home. It, which means no man, no storm, no virus, no snakes, no plane, no pandemic decides what my death date is. God determines that. God determines that. You are immortal until God calls you home. I learned that. I learned what this passage meant firsthand. I was flying down some years ago to Louisiana to go preach. I didn't know what God wanted me to say, and I felt that God put a word in my heart for the church that I was going to. I felt that God dropped something in my spirit. Now, to get to Louisiana and where I was going, you couldn't fly direct. And I was here living in Brooklyn and you couldn't get down there. So you had to go through Atlanta and then fly into, into Louisiana. When we were flying, it was during hurricane season. And while we were flying, I'm telling you folks, it was the worst turbulence. It was the worst weather. And that plane was going up and it was a small plane. It was going up and down. And I'm telling you, I didn't realize how many Christians were on that plane because everybody kept saying, oh, Jesus. And so I was going, this must be a Christian plane. This is what makes this absolutely amazing. And it's going up and down. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I'm going like, we could have church right here with the oh, Jesus people. But here's what I knew. I knew God put a word in my heart that needed to be delivered to that church. So while everybody else was saying, oh Jesus, I knew that that plane needed to get to the ground because God put a word inside of my heart. I didn't do it, but I should have said, all of you get to live because I'm getting ready to preach a word in this church and you're welcome. That's where the Apostle Paul was. Everybody gets to live on the ship. But let me talk to you about the other side of the storm, Times Square Church. Just when you thought the storm was over, something else that we have to face. And this is where I want to start today in Acts 28. The Bible says this, that when they had been brought safely through, then we found out, found out that the island where they shipwrecked on was called Malta. Listen to those words again. Safely through through, which means they made it. Now just wait, because as soon as you catch your breath, here comes verses two and three. You ready for this? As soon as you go, we made it. The Bible says the natives showed us extraordinary kindness. You're going like, okay, thank God the storm is over. If because of the rain that it set in, because of the cold, they kindled the fire and received us all. And then it says this in verse three, but when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. Look up here for just a second. Those that are watching online, I want you to listen to this. Last Sunday, we were able to open up Times Square Church after 18 months. We celebrated what God has brought us safely through. But I wish I was over there where our deaf ministry is interpreting, standing right over there. And I wish you could have seen what I saw the first time those doors were opened and what it did for my heart. The line, they said, started at 7 a.m. to get in here at 10 a.m. The line went down, and then we, we, we just opened up the front doors, and you couldn't fit everybody in the lobby. And then at 9 o'clock, when these doors opened up, Folks, I saw people coming down, and I'll never forget the sight. After 18 months, people came in crying, singing, rejoicing, running down. The, they came like captives out of Babylon back to Jerusalem and to worship God. I watched them come down, and I was going like, hey, 
this was a pandemic. This wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. This was, this was a moment. And I watched it. 18 months of a storm. And last Sunday as we sang, we rejoiced, we shouted. And we were safely through. But listen, get it now. But we got safely through. But buckle up. Because though the storm is over, the snakes come out. Because then our ship landed on Monday. And oh, is there a Monday. All of a sudden, we started to hear and started to pray from, from COVID cases that we, we started to pray and go, God, we're going to pray healing. I'm just being honest with you. And we started to pray. And then on Tuesday, I got footage that came in of, um, from Elder Chris and our security team that there was a knife attack right here. On two, I'm going like, we just got through. And now you got COVID and knives. You have things that are starting to come up and, and all of a sudden you started to think that what you're faced with, that as we're sitting here, I'm once again, I'm reminded, God's promise is a safe landing, but not always a smooth flight. But let me tell you this about this journey, Times Square Church. I want to encourage you that we are going to be victorious. That though the viper will strike, this is what it says. I love these words. Listen to that verse three again. A viper came out. Hear these words. Say them with me, those last four words. Because of the heat. You know the way I could say this? The fire awakened the snake. <laughs> and here's what I want to tell you. If Times Square Church is on fire, snakes come out. Let me just tell you, don't get on a dead churches. The enemy's not interested in let the fire of God fall down in this place. Go ahead and announce that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it's a heat that will awake the snake. But I want to tell you, just like the apostle Paul, that greater is he that is in you, that when that snake latches on, I love what the apostle Paul did. He didn't rebuke it. He didn't cry out to the devil. He didn't look and rebuke anything else. He just shook it off and kept going on. That sometimes you just got to go, you know what? I've got these hands. I just got to shake this thing off and let God do what God wants to do. Hallelujah. We will be victors, but Satan will not allow us, Times Square Church, to get into every home on this planet without putting up a fight. The enemy knew he needed a viper to stop the Apostle Paul. Why? We'll get to that in a second. But if our goal is not only to open up the doors on 51st and Broadway, but to open up doors around the world. The snake will come out after the storm. Once we open up these doors, we have got to get ready because the heat is going to awake the snake. When I see countries and states connecting, that's fire. And where there is fire, there are snakes. And I want to prepare us just for two thoughts today. I want to encourage you and I want to prepare you today I want to prepare you for the snakes after the storm. I want you to write down these two things. Because I want to walk you through this. That I see in the life of Paul. And here's, what, here's the first thing. We, and I'm going to explain this, is better than me. Let me say that again. We is better than me. Those that have walked with me on staff here for the last 18 months have heard these words. That words matter. And one word in this passage is really important. Let me read it to you. It's Acts 28.1 that we read already, but sometimes we can miss this small little word. Listen to this word. It says, when they had been brought safely through, then, here comes the word, we found out that the island was called Malta. Pastor Tim, why is that important? Get this down now. The we passages in the book of Acts show that Luke, the writer and the doctor, is present with the Apostle Paul. These occur in such important spots in the book of Acts. It's where Paul is not alone, but he's walking with somebody through some of the toughest times. It, it is the we passages are evident in, in, in Acts, but this is where Luke inserts himself 
as the writer, is found in Acts 16 when the gospel goes to Europe. That's where you see another wee passage. In Acts 20, remember the upper room where Paul preached a really long time and a kid falls through the window, Eutychus falls down and dies. The, it, was, it was Luke that says we were there to see that resurrection of that young man. It's in Acts 21 when, Phil, when they're going to see Philip and they hear a prophecy that whoever wears this band is going to go to suffering in Jerusalem. Luke heard that prophecy and then again here in Acts 28. That little word we tells us a lot. We means Luke, and I want you to get this, Luke is on the ship. Luke is there at the shipwreck. Luke is on the ocean floating with Paul on a piece of wood. Luke is on an island when he sees his companion get struck by a snake. And here's what I began to realize. Even the most spiritual man on the planet needed someone with him on his journey. Even the most spiritual man on the planet needed somebody with him on this journey. I want to ask you a question, Times Scripture. I want to ask you online, no matter where you're watching from, and that's this. Do you have someone that will go through shipwrecks, storms, and snake bites and adverse conditions with you? Listen, I don't need a golf buddy. I don't need a fantasy football comrade. I don't need someone to go with me to the Brooklyn, to the Barclays Center, or the Bronx to Yankee Stadium. I need to know someone can float on wood with me. I need to know that when a snake bites and strikes my home, that you're there, that you're going to be walking through with that. Folks, I think we try to get the wrong comrades in our life because what we need is I want to know, can you float on wood in the middle of an ocean when it's really cold? That's what we're looking for. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for times of adversity. Or one version says it like this, friends love through all kinds of weather, whether it's stormy or whether it's stunny, I need people to go through that no matter how spiritual you are, you need people on this spiritual journey with you. That's why these connect groups are so important, church. That, that's why we're challenging countries around the globe. That I'm telling you, there are people here that will go through storms with you, that will float on wood with you, that will help you shake off snakes. That if you're watching today and you're going, I feel alone in this country. I feel alone in the Middle East. I feel alone in, 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 in this nation, in Northern Africa. I want to tell you, there are believers around the world that are going to say, if you're floating, we'll float with you. If you're bit, we'll shake it off with you. And if you need a word from God, we're going to pray with you that God will give you that word. We want to believe for God to do that because I'm just telling you, I can't do this by myself. I need godly people. And you better make sure you have a we and your we is a serious Christian. Because the wrong we will mess up your life. Don't raise your hand, because you may be sitting next to your we. Let me tell you a story of someone who found their we that we were given permission to tell. This happened last week. It's Elizabeth's story. I, I, Elizabeth's story is incredible. This came to us on Monday. Elizabeth was here for the 1 p.m. service last week. But a journey to Times Square Church wasn't on the docket for her to come to 1 p.m. at Times Square Church. She was on her way to Central Park from New Jersey to play her guitar in Central Park. While she's on a New Jersey transit bus, she's sitting next to an older Filipino woman who is watching the 10 a.m. service on her phone on her way to the 1 p.m. service. So Elizabeth, the Central Park guitar player, asked the older Filipino mom, here comes the we, asked the older Filipino mom, what concert are you watching? <laughs> this is awesome. Filipino mom looks at Elizabeth and says, I'm watching worship at my church. In fact, I think you should come to church with me. Elizabeth, and now, instead of going to Central Park by herself, now, Elizabeth turns from a me to a we. And this Filipino mom walks Elizabeth into Times Square Church last week at 1 p.m. And not only, you ready for this? 
Not only did Elizabeth come to church, when it was time to be born again, Elizabeth raised her hand. And not only did Elizabeth raise her hand, when our prayer teams prayed for people at the end, Elizabeth came down to be prayed for. And not only did she get prayed for, our hospitality team took her to the next steps. Not only did Elizabeth go to the next steps, but Elizabeth got connected with our next gen and our college ministry that's there. Because if Elizabeth is a me, she ends up playing a guitar in Central Park and going back to the same life. But because there's a we, and her we wasn't Luke the doctor, it was a Filipino mom who sat on that bus watching that And who knew? I just couldn't see. Listen, I'm just guessing. I couldn't see that Filipino mom with earbuds on. So I I have this sense that Filipino mom had the volume up watching that thing on that bus. But let me tell you something. Elizabeth's me turned into a we. And that we is one day going to be rejoicing in heaven. Because Elizabeth became born again on that day. Let me close with this. And watch where the snake bites, because it may tell you something. Watch where the enemy is going after, because snake strikes are strategic. Satan strikes areas, get this down. Satan strikes areas that God wants to use. Let me say that again. Satan strikes areas that God wants to use. Okay, side note here. The storm is over and it left Paul and Luke in a place that wasn't on their itinerary. They weren't, they didn't know they were going to end up in Malta. They didn't, they didn't realize that. And here's what I started to realize. When this New York City storm, this global pandemic ended, I know there are people that we don't see anymore because they're living in a different place because the storm changed so many different things physically and some spiritually and some both. But God has a way of using storms to get us to the place that we're supposed to be. Or I love what one person said. She said this, sometimes good things fall apart so better things can fall together. That boat fell apart because God was about to do something on the island of Malta. See, God has a way of using storms to bring us to places in our lives that we wouldn't have gone to on our own. And I think that happened with us here. See, it's called the providence of God. If I had to define the providence of God, and this is important for me just to take a little side note here. Providence is God using circumstances to direct our steps and get us in the right place. I believe that these last 18 months, God brought us, Times Square Church, to a Malta where we wouldn't have gone on our own. It redefined us of what we're supposed to do just with, with, with connect groups and technology and not just open up doors of a church, but open up every door around the world. And that's providence. It's the providential hand of God going like, you thought it was a shipwreck and you thought it was a snake bite, but I was gonna do a whole bunch more through that. I, I, I love the story. I mean, God can use anything. I was reading the story of a pastor who pastored a storefront church in the Midwest And this is important. The pastor's church, just a little small church, the name of the pastor's church, you ready for this? Was Almighty God Tabernacle of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, Apostolic Church of God in Christ. I think there are more words than there were people in the church. Let me read that again because this is important. Almighty God Tabernacle of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, Apostolic Church of God in Christ. I'm so thankful for Times Square Church. (laughs) I'm just going to tell you that. Saturday night, this pastor went to that storefront church and was preparing his message for Sunday. And as was his always is what he did. Here's Providence. 10 p.m. is usually when he calls his wife and says, I'm on my way home. And the pastor said he got on the phone, called his wife, and no one answered the phone. And he let the phone ring many times. But it was odd that she didn't answer because it was always a phone call, honey, I'm on my way, and she didn't answer. He hung up and then he tried again and his wife answered immediately. And he just goes, why didn't she answer the first time? She said it never rang. The phone never rang. So he just brushed it off as just simply as a fluke and went on his merry way. And, but always remember the providence of God. God working out circumstances. Here's what happens. 
this pastor told a story that the Monday after service, the pastor received a call at his church office from the phone that he used Saturday night and a man spoke and said, why did you call my house on Saturday night at 10 p.m.? The pastor couldn't figure out who this guy was and what he was talking about. And then the guy said, it rang and rang, but I didn't answer. And then the pastor remembered, he goes, oh my goodness, that was me. I hope I didn't wake you, that was my fault. And the pastor profusely apologized. And the man said, that's okay, let me tell you a story. Here comes Providence, get ready. The man said, I was planning to commit suicide on Saturday night, but before I did, the gun was loaded and ready to go. I prayed, God, if you're there and you don't want me to do this, give me a sign. He said, I have on my landline a caller ID and your church couldn't fit on that except the first couple words which was this god almighty <laughs> he said at 10 a at 10 p.m the phone rang and it was god almighty rescuing me that night come on jesus all right back to the island I have to say this. You know what I loved about this story is, now, remember that they're building a fire. You know what I loved is, you remember who's gathering the wood? The Apostle Paul. Isn't it amazing that the greatest Christian on the planet saw that gathering sticks was still a worthy task? Instead of him going like, I'm the Apostle. This is my third mission. This is me. Instead of him going like, I don't do sticks. <laughs> Let me just tell you something. Here at Times Square Church, we serve. So we do, we do greeting, we do nursery, we do online, we do this. Don't ever think that you're sitting in a chair makes it unwell. If the Apostle Paul can pick up sticks, we can serve in the house of God. So don't ever think that something is an unworthy task. That was for free, that's a side note. Okay, here we go. The snake will bite the area where we serve God in the greatest capacity. This is what I wanna close with. Here it comes. Look at Acts 28, verse three. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, laid them on the fire, a viper came out. We read this because of the heat. It fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, undoubtedly, this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. Here it is, here are the words. And fastened itself on his hand. Church, watch where the snake bites because you may learn something. Here's my question. Why did the snake strike his hand? You ready for this? Because Paul was supposed to write four more New Testament books. Why would he strike his hand? Because he had four more New Testament books that needed to come out. What Paul was about, here comes the seed. You can't hold that seed down, folks. What Paul was about to write would not just be available for the churches in that, in that first century. It would be available to every person on the planet for thousands of years later because it is the seed, the word of God. Can I give you just a sneaky personal thought that I have here? I have this sneaky suspicion about the snake bite. I think, number one, it was his writing hand. I really do. I think Paul was putting sticks there and that serpent went on that hand that was so, so if he was a righty, I think it hit his right hand because that was the hand. And I think, here, this is total, this is total supposition. I also believe not only his writing hand, I believe he had two little snake scars on his hand, that as he was writing those books of the New Testament, I have this thought that as he's writing, he'd look down and see that serpent bite, and all of a sudden, he would look at his hand and say, that seed is still going out, devil. That seed is still going out. You try to stop it, but let me just tell you something. All you got were two little scars. I got four more books to touch the planet that is gonna begin to touch people's lives. Let me put it to you this way. 
I grew up, I'm gonna age myself here, I, because I, I think this is important, because Paul's Roman jail cell produced those four New Testament books. Let me just give them to you before I say this. Paul's four New Testament books, here it comes, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon still needed to be written, needed to be written. Those four books didn't, still needed to come. And here's why I needed Paul to bounce back. Here's where I date myself. Um, I grew up as a kid in the 60s. How many remember this crazy toy that was a Bozo the Clown? Come on, I got some old people here. I've seen you, okay? How many know what I'm talking? Go ahead, you can, come on, folks. We already know you're old. Come on, just go ahead and raise, it, raise your hand. It was this rubber thing, this Bozo the Clown with a red nose, and if you hit it, what happened? It came right back up. Folks, I'm telling you, I not only would hit it, I would take a wiffle ball bat, I would strike it. What it would do? Came right back up and smiled at me. I threw a shoe at it. It would come right back. I kicked it. I threw things at it. And no matter what you did, that thing kept coming right back up. Because here was the issue. Because on the bottom of that thing, it wasn't the plastic on the outside. It was something that they put on the bottom of that. They put a weight on the bottom, which says no matter what you do externally, there's something stronger internally that says you can knock it down. It comes back up smiling right in your face. That you can look at this thing. I'm telling you, you can throw, listen, that what was in it internally would not be dictated by the externals that was supposed to come. That's why you can throw Paul in a shipwreck. He shows right back up. You can send frigid cold weathers. He shows right back up. You can strike him with a snake. He shows right back up. And the same Jesus, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in every single one of you that I want you to understand today that no matter what comes against, it's not the externals that controls, it's the internals that control. So when all of a sudden I look back at the snake bite and I start to realize people that I love this week who've been snake bit with that virus this week. Listen, Cindy and I, we, we, as soon as we opened up the church, there was one day we were fighting over this stupid dog that we have now and just going like, and finally Cindy goes, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. This, first of all, the dog, I, that's another story. Okay, for another message. But let me just tell you this. And she goes, let's not be ignorant. He's trying to attack. And then Cindy got hit with some sickness and she couldn't come today. And I said, Cindy, you know what this is? It's the enemy trying to knock us down. Because ministry is not, is not me. Ministry is we. We do this together. And I said, the enemy is trying to separate us. So when all of a sudden, we, so today, as I started to realize, wait a second, the enemy's coming, we come right back up because it's not what's external, it's what's internal. And the apostle Paul said it like this. Listen to these words. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, we are like clay jars in which this treasure is stored. That's the bottom, that's the weighty stuff. The real power comes from God and not from us. And I love verse eight, here it comes. We often suffer, but we're never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. And here it comes. In times of trouble, God is with us. Get ready, folks. And when we are not down, hallelujah, we get right back up again because it's who is in us at this very time. I needed the Apostle Paul to bounce back. I needed him to come right up. Why? Because those prison letters with snake bite scars, I needed the Apostle Paul to write these words and remind me to put on the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. I needed the Apostle Paul to remind me to him who is able to do far more abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I needed the Apostle Paul to write the book of Philippians and 
say, at that name, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. I needed the Apostle Paul to write in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I needed the Apostle Paul to write these words, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I needed the Apostle Paul to write, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God and the peace of God shall, shall begin to comfort. The peace of God will begin to come and surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds. With snake scars on his hand, God gave me the verse that I needed. God gave you the verse. Why? Because greater was he that was in him than he that was in the world. There's a verse in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. I want you to listen to these words and then we're gonna close in prayer. Here's what it says. When the storm is over, there's nothing left of the wicked. Good people, firm on the rock, aren't even phased. They keep coming right back up. There are people sitting in this place or people watching online that you have said these words, I can't take another thing. I can't take another friend having COVID. I can't take another close. I can't take another school shut down. I can't take school online. I can't take my kids being at home for another semester. And I'm here to tell you, there are some listening that no matter what comes, they bounce right back up because, because what's inside of them is strong. There are some here that the storms have hurt you. The losses have crushed you. The news has depressed you. And you need something to make it. Or let me be real clear. You need someone to make it. You need Jesus to make it. And I have a promise for you that can go through any storm or any snake bite. That can face any external because of what, of who is inside of you. Because you don't have to be at the mercy of anything externally when Christ is on the inside. The question is, why, can, why can't you bounce back? Some of you are going like, why can't I bounce back? I go to church. It's not a matter of you being in church. It's Christ has to be in you. See, that's what people are mistaken. They're going like, I go to church. That's not, that's not what Christianity is. It's the greatest thing that can ever happen. It's when Christ comes and changes us from the inside out. And today, wherever you're sitting, if you're watching online, around the country and around the world, today, I'm telling you, you, not only can, you are being controlled by the externals because you didn't take care of an internal issue. And the internal issue is, I need Christ inside of me. Not me simply in a church, not me in a Catholic church, a Muslim mosque, a Jewish synagogue, not me in a denomination, not me in, in the Baptist church, in the Methodist church, in the Lutheran church. Let me just tell you something. None of that can save you from a storm. And look at me, neither can Times Square Church. I need Christ in me. I need Christ in me. Pastor Tim, what does that mean? Most important thing, most important question to be asked today. I get it. We, we want to be cautious and we may not be able to do altar calls and all those things. I, I get it. I'm, I'm okay with that. But we, but we, let me just tell you something. You could be sitting in your seat. You could be transformed today. You could be sitting on a New Jersey transit bus and be transformed like Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, if you're here or we're going to see at the 1 p.m., I'm so happy that you started a journey. But this is the way Elizabeth started a journey. Christ came into her life and he can do that for you. Maybe someone invited you today. Maybe someone sent you the link to this message. Whatever this means. I'm here to tell you this. Jesus said, what does it mean to have Christ inside of you? Jesus uses a phrase and this is Jesus' words. It's not Times Square Church. These are Jesus' words. He says, you have to be born again. Those are Jesus' words. 
Well, some would go like, but I was border baptized. I was christened. I, was, I go to church. I'm a good person. Those are all good things. That's not what Jesus said. He said, you must, you must be born again. That's John 3.3 3 and John 3.5. Why is that important, Pastor Tim? Jesus said, you must be born again. Here's what's amazing. If Jesus said, you must, then you can't make it optional. You can't decide, well, I'll just, I'll just do it my own way. Not if Jesus said, you must. No man can see the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, unless you're born again. Pastor Tim, what does that mean? Jesus was saying, just as you had a first birth, you need a second birth. Just as you were born physically, you have to be born spiritually. Well, how does that happen? Just simple as A, B, C. Those letters correspond to a word, A. It's admitting that I'm a sinner. It's when I get honest with God that everyone, starting with even me, the speaker today, have a condition called sin. And I can't fix it myself. There's not a promise or a program that can fix it. There's not a priest or a pastor that can fix it. We need help to fix it. We're broken on the inside. The diagnosis is sin. And unless it's fixed, it is terminal. That's why one pastor said, we're not mistakers in need of correction. We are sinners in need of a savior. We don't need a second chance. We need a second birth today. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? That's the B word, believe. Believe that God loves us so much that he sent his son to fix that sinful condition. I couldn't fix myself. If I could fix myself, then why would God have to put his son on the cross to suffer all that pain? If I could fix myself by being good or fix myself by just simply coming to a building, then Jesus would never have to come. But he did have to come. He would become mine and your sin bearer today. Whether you're watching live right now or whether you're listening on a Monday or a Tuesday, you may be listening, driving in a car. You may be on a train. You may be in a different part of the world. And I'm here to tell you this. Jesus became your sin bearer today. He died the death that I was supposed to die. Live a life that I couldn't even live and gave us a reward, heaven and forgiveness that I didn't deserve. And finally, it's confessing Jesus as Lord. These are the strong words, folks. This is Romans 10, 9, and 10. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? When the Bible says you have to confess him as Lord, it says you're the boss now. You're in charge. You have veto rights over, over everything in my life. And you do it through your word. That God's goal, listen to me. God's goal was not to get you to sit in a church on a Sunday for 90 minutes or two hours. God's goal was to get you to heaven to live with him forever. That's what God's goal is. And that can happen today because Christianity is not coming to a person. It's not coming to a place. It's coming to a person. That person can change you today. That can happen right now. That's the inter internal part because when he is in us, we can face anything outside. I want you to bow your head all over this place. I want you just to close your eyes and bow your head. We do have limitations here and we're trying to be cautious and protocol, but I'm so glad that God is not limited by limitations or protocols. And you may be sitting in this place today, and I want to invite you to make the most important decision of your life, which is to be born again. And some of you are listening to these words going, Pastor Tim, I'm not perfect. Exactly. None of us are. Perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And today could be the beginning of your journey, like it was for Elizabeth, like it is for 70,000 people around the world every day, making a decision to say, Jesus change me from the inside out. If you're listening online or if you're right here in this place and say, Pastor Tim, I, I want to take the next step. I'm going to pray a prayer. I want to pray a prayer. It's not a prayer. This prayer is not magic. It can't change you. It has to come from your heart to say, I want to start a journey. And no matter what condition you are in, you may say, I've ruined my life. You may say, I've got so much going on in my life, but I'm, I'm here to tell you this. You cannot face the externals unless the internals are together. And God has to be in your life. And today it can start. If you're sitting here today with every head bowed and every eye closed, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. As I get ready to pray this prayer, and we're all going to pray it together, but if you're sitting here, and you may be watching online, but if you're sitting in this place, and you say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, I want you to include me in that. I want to start a journey today. I'm going to ask you to do something for me without any hesitation. I can't invite you down right now. 
I can't make you stand. I want to be very careful, but I can't ask you to do this because you need skin in the game to say, I want to make that decision today. If you're here, balcony, main floor, and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, I want to start that journey. I want to be part of that. Without any hesitation, if that's you, quickly, wherever you're at, hold up your hand right now. Say, put me in that prayer. Hold it up as high as you can because I want to make sure I see it. Keep them up. I'm going to start from my left. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Keep them up. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Got you over there. I want to see the balcony. 23, 24, 25. Keep them up. That's fantastic. 26. You can put your hands down. That's a blessing. Thank God for those that have made that decision today. Hey, let's all pray this together. Come on, Times Square Church. Say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's put our hands together for those that made that decision. Now here's what I need you to do. Here's what I need you to do. If you prayed this prayer, come on, if you're sitting in that seat right now and if you're watching online, you prayed this prayer, I want you to text the word CONNECT to 51,000. Come on, don't, don't pretend you can't do it. All of a sudden you, you know how to text and now all of a sudden you're going like, I don't know what to do. You know what to do. Text that word CONNECT to 51,000 and we're going to help you on your next steps of what God wants, of God wants to do. Now. We'll help you there. But there are some people that just may need some personal prayer. Those that are watching online and those in this place. Let me tell you what we do and what, we're, what we feel comfortable in doing. The leadership and I talked about this. If you want personal prayer, when Freddie leads us in this final song and says amen, we're going to have prayer teams up here. And you can come down and we'll be socially distanced. And we want to pray for any personal needs that are here. If you're online, we have online prayer hosts. You can type in and our responders are going to type right back. Our prayer teams are going to type right back. And we want to pray that God does something. Can we just close in prayer and pray this together? Come on, let's, let's believe for God to do it. God, would you take all those that have made that decision today? Lord, change every part of their life. They have made a decision for that internal to be changed. They can face anything on the outside. We know this to be true, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We bless you. We praise you. I pray every person in this place, you protect them right now. Cover them as they leave this place. I ask you that God, wherever they're going after this place, when they walk out of here, as Freddie left us, we would say that they are blessed in the city. And if they live in a field, let them be blessed. I pray you cover them, their families. I pray that Lord, that wherever they go, they would know the blessing of the Lord, the hand of God to be on them. And we're going to believe that Father, the best is yet to come in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen.